Electro Coffee. And today, uh, we have a guest speaker, Ruahi. I hope I pronounce your surname right, uh, Ruahi Jazi, a counselor. Thank you, with correct. Great. Uh, a counselor with our uh, uh, health and safety department. And she will be speaking about uh, what, what keeps you up at night during the corona uh, virus pandemic, and I'm sure we all identify with the fact that we're well, not, well, I should speak for myself, not sleeping as well as we, we could or we used to. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about today, our session will run for about 60 to 75 minutes. Rua will begin with her presentation, and then we will break for some Q&As. Uh, from all of you, because I'm sure it will stir up some questions. And at the end of the session, Rua will lead us in a sleep meditation, which I hope will give you something that you can use tonight. We can all put it to practice tonight. And uh, before I hand over to Rua, just some housekeeping rules. Uh, could I ask that all of you uh, mute yourself? so that we can hear her better. And of course, unmute uh, when you do want to uh, uh, speak. Rua has also provided us with some excellent materials for sleep hygiene, stress management. And we will be posting this on the WBFN uh, uh, website. And uh, apart from muting, we also uh, have the chat box. Uh, which you can use. Uh, my colleague Carla and our president, Pamini, will also be keeping an eye on this chat box so that uh, we, we can be sure that your questions are answered. So uh, before I hand over to Rua, uh, Pamini, our president, would you like to say anything to the group? Yeah, hello and welcome to everybody. We are really happy to see a very good response to uh, this session on sleep disturbances during the virus pandemic. Um, uh, I myself experience it as well as my husband and my children. And uh, we're looking forward to a very interesting session from Rua, who is a wonderful counselor from the Family Consultation Unit. We also have today with us Malahat, who is a senior counselor uh, in the same unit. And uh, many of our regular uh, volunteers and Kat, our coordinator for WBFN. So uh, let's start with the session. Thank you, Rua. Thank you, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar. I am very glad to be here among uh, all of you today, uh, virtually. Are you guys hearing me? Yes. So I'm glad to be here virtually among you. Um, as uh, uh, you guys mentioned, I'm a counselor at the Family Consultation Service Program and the Domestic Abuse Prevention Program. And today we're gonna be talking about what's keeping us up at night during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, you may want to take a moment right now and throw some ideas in the chat box, a word or two about what's keeping you up at night these days. And maybe we can go back to, uh, to them and share with the group when we move through with our discussion, maybe to have a sense of what people are experiencing. And while you are doing that, let me share the presentation with you so that we can see Okay, do you see the presentation? Is it clear for you? Let me put it at this one. It needs to be uh, cover the whole screen, so you need to enlarge it. How about now? Good, good, good. All right. So let us start with the outline for today. Wonderful. So I will discuss today with you what are the stressors that are resulting from the pandemic and the quarantine. Uh, I will also look at the impact of the pandemic on our psychosocial well-being. 
and what are some of the coping strategies that can help us. We will also look at how our sleep is affected by the coronavirus uh, stress and anxiety. Uh, you already mentioned that this is an issue that may be, you know, uh, relevant for the WBFN population. Sleep is a very important component of our wellness, and we will talk about the challenges to getting a good sleep, especially during these times. I will also talk about the benefits of sleep and the problems resulting from sleep deprivation and how we can actually better manage our sleep and promote our wellness. Uh, we will end today, as uh, Yvonne mentioned, with a relaxation practice that will help us usually feel more calm and grounded, and in general, it does help with sleep. Um, so, let's start and... Second slide. And this is when we're going to start talking a little bit about the stressors. We are all living through unprecedented times of uncertainty due to the coronavirus pandemic. We are also experiencing stressors that are very much related to the nature of this pandemic, especially with the social distancing and the quarantine. So what are some of those stressors? Uh, the Lancet, a medical journal, did a study on those stresses and identified the following. One is fear of the infection, both fears about getting infected yourself and fears of infecting others. This is a major stress for people right now. I would like to ask um, a people if they can mute, because I'm hearing some, some people in the background. I would really appreciate that. Thank you. So this is a very important stressor that people all over the world are experiencing. What about the second stressor, which is frustration and boredom? They reduce social and physical contact with others and having to stay uh, confined at home may cause frustration for people, boredom, and also a sense of isolation from the world. Um, especially for older people living by themselves who depend on visits from friends and family for company, the sense of isolation will be, will be even more keenly felt. Uh, for us, for our World Bank families, we can add to it the stress related to travel constraints, to be with aging parents, for example, or with extended family, member, with family members, which can cause even a lot of anxiety as well. We have a special, you know, a makeup for our population, and we need to be, we need to be careful about what is specific for us. Um, the inadequate supplies, we've all experienced, uh, you know, we've seen when basic supplies such as food, water, or clothes for people are unavailable, it can be also a source of uh, worry and anger for some. Inadequate information, sometimes poor information or unclear guidelines about actions to take is a huge stressor for people, especially at the beginning of the outbreak. Uh, it can lead to confusion and lack of trust. Uh, for World Bank families, for example, this is very relevant as many people are not living in their own country and uh, some of them are also located in country offices. Um, so they could be facing additional barriers to accessing information, maybe due to language barriers sometimes, culture, lifestyle, and they may be even getting conflicting information sometimes from the country where they are, where they are based versus maybe the recommendations that are coming from headquarters. So navigating those unfamiliar spaces can sometimes also be very stressful for us. Financial loss, especially post-quarantine, uh, the inability to work and having to discontinue professional and business activities with no advanced planning, uh, that can cause financial losses and create serious, serious socioeconomic distress. This is also a risk factor, uh, by the way, for psychological disorders, also for anger and anxiety, even several months after the quarantine. So yes, we are hoping for this definitely to end, but also we need to be careful, even after it ends, how we can have like a, a soft landing, as we say, how we can manage to help people even after the quarantine ends or the social distancing ends. And finally, the issue of stigma. People who had quarantine because they either had the coronavirus or were exposed to it in some ways may suffer from stigmatization from others or from people in their neighborhoods, such as they can feel that people are treating them differently by avoiding them, 
treating them with fear and suspicion. And some, sometimes even in some societies, the panic can go to a place where they feel even rejected by society sometimes, unfortunately. Of course, there is the positive side, which we're going to talk about, and this is the sense of solidarity and the sense of community that also is a result of this pandemic. But let me stay with the, uh, you know, beyond the stresses, those stresses, what are they causing in terms of our psychosocial well-being? First thing is stress. Given this unprecedented uncertainty and the challenges uh, brought by the coronavirus pandemic, it is completely natural if stress levels have gone up. In fact, stress is a common response. It's a common response of the body and mind to any change or demand. Stress is normal and can even save us from danger by triggering our fight or flight response. Probably you've heard about this. However, severe and ongoing stress can be considered as a risk factor for mental health conditions if it persists. So one of the things that first comes to mind uh, for our, the impact of, of, of all those stresses is really the stress element. But also there's fear and worry about our own health and the health of our loved ones. Uh, fear, again, is a response to a perceived threat to safety. It is expected during these times of high, of high uncertainty. However, similar to stress, if fear is prolonged, it means that our stress response is constantly activated, which has negative health outcomes. In addition to fear, people can experience anxiety during the pandemic due to mainly two factors that are really very much about this pandemic, and those are uncertainty and the lack of control. So these two factors are, by definition, what makes us sometimes anxious, anxiety that we cannot understand where it's coming from, and these elements are so much existing in this pandemic these days. So many people are also feeling anxious. Anger and irritability, these are also common responses, and they are common responses to helplessness and feeling also out of control. Many people sometimes find it easier to express their fear as anger, so it's kind of the hidden fear, since it is sometimes easier to tolerate than helplessness. Helplessness is a very difficult feeling that we don't want to deal with, so some people choose anger. Loss and grief. Either loss of people we know who have actually died from the COVID-19, but also undeniably other types of losses um, that we are all experiencing right now and that we must grieve those losses. For example, loss of a job, uh, loss of personal and close contact with family and friends, uh, even the loss of a lifestyle, such as going to restaurants, attending cultural events. Those are things that we use sometimes to cope and we are losing them um, at this moment. Of course, there are substitutes and we're gonna talk about this later. But it's important to acknowledge the losses and to grieve a little bit those losses. Add to it for our uh, World Bank families, uh, the, also the loss of access to loved ones, uh, maybe in other, in other countries. That also makes it a huge loss. We're thinking about this all the time. Many people are. Uh, the substance abuse, according to the CDC, for example, an increase in alcohol, nicotine, and drugs can actually um, happen during an infectious disease uh, such as this one. It is also possible that people may use substances to cope. This is an unhealthy way of coping with the stress. So very important to uh, work on developing different and healthier coping skills. Um, the increase in relationship conflict. Um, this is another manifestation uh, of, of the stressors. It's what happens in families. So with the increase in pressure and stress, and the lack of the regular support systems, especially the social support system, and the lack of resources sometimes, tensions can increase in the family environment. So many people uh, maybe were doing relatively well because people in those families were going their separate ways to work during the day, only to come together in the evenings. Not necessarily all families are staying together because you know, they want to be together. Maybe they are finding a different way of um, living separate lives when they are still living together. Well, for those people now, they are together all day, 24 seven, and sometimes in a small space. So they may witness some accelerating tension in the relationship. I mean, in fact, if you look at what's happening around us, 
uh, around the world, we notice that domestic violence has increased and it is expected to increase even further with the continuing emotional and financial strains uh, that are associated with economic downturns and as we start to see also the impact on the on our socioeconomic uh, well-being um, of course at the world bank we have a domestic abuse prevention program and that program works to support everyone who's experiencing domestic violence sleep deprivation this is our uh, topic that we're going to shift to in a little bit it's uh, it's another unfortunate consequence of the pandemic and it is actually caused by most, most of the factors that we just mentioned. Stress, anxiety, uh, the losses that we are experiencing, the conflict, all those stresses uh, eventually are going to affect how we sleep. We're going to talk more in detail about that. But first, let us look at how we can respond to the coronavirus stress. Yes, things are difficult, but we are able to do several things to make sure that we manage our our situation right now. Stay positive. Maybe people are going to look at me and say, how can we stay positive? Everything is negative. Well, let's try to look at the you know, bright side, which is also a realistic side in a way. Um, let's connect with our strength. This is the this idea of looking at the positive side and connecting with our strength. It comes from positive psychology, which can help us really a lot during these times. And it tells us something, it tells us that how we look at any particular event, and in this case, the coronavirus pandemic, will not be all of the following. The event is not gonna be all of the following. It's not gonna be permanent. That is, most things are actually gonna pass. Even though we can, we can we think that this is almost permanent, it is, it is gonna end. It, it cannot be pervasive, which means that it cannot invade every aspect of your life. So even if you are losing maybe your job, you may still have uh, wonderful relationships uh, in your family, you still have a couple, you still have a, a, a relationship with your child. And personal, it's not going to be personal. This is not about you. This is, maybe we are all very upset with the lockdown, with the social distancing, but it is not personal. We're all in this together. We're all experiencing the same situation. So the idea is that looking at it from this, this gives us a sense of perspective. We can look at things maybe differently. The second uh, maybe skill to develop during these times is to be again rational. This is what we call cognitive reframing. So getting rid of irrational or negative thoughts and reframing them by replacing them with more adaptive and realistic ones. This is, this is the basis of uh, how cognitive reframing works. So it is basically about changing the frame with which we are looking at the same event. Simply put, it's about looking at things differently. For example, if I'm having a thought such as, I am gonna get sick with the coronavirus, I am having this thought right now. Well, you may wanna challenge that thought you know, by, by doing what? By gathering evidence, for example, and seeing, am I taking enough precautions? Am I following the guidelines? Uh, what is the, the likelihood of this happening if I'm actually abiding by the social distancing and by all the cleaning procedures that are required. That gives us a different way of looking at the same event and maybe it will affect how we feel about it. <clears throat> Finding solutions. More than ever, this is the time to develop your problem solving skills. We have to be creative. We have to uh, look at things uh, in, a, in a way that, um, that is different. The same thing, maybe it's a, uh, for example, if I cannot go to the gym, I can do online exercising or I can take an online class. So this skill is also about focusing on what you can control. Make sure that, you know, the loss of control is very stressful for people these days, many people. Maybe you should look, try to find what can I control? Yes, I cannot control going to uh, maybe uh, visit my, my family uh, or I cannot, uh, in another country, or I cannot uh, go to uh, my uh, gym, as I just mentioned. What can I control? I can control that while I'm here, I can connect still with people and I can still maybe do some exercising. It makes us, you know, it gives us a sense of agency and we need, we need that. It's, it's the difference on the spectrum between helplessness and agency. And staying connected. Uh, so this is a very important, uh, you know, uh, strength that we need to develop in order to be able to deal with the situation. 
Social distancing does not mean social isolation. We've heard this several times. Uh, we can still connect, uh, just like we are doing right now. However, what is different now is that I feel we need to be more intentional about connecting. There is an intention there to do it. It's not going to come uh, uh, normally. So we need to, uh, more planning, maybe. Maybe have a schedule or a plan of the day that includes time for connecting. Uh, there are so many online platforms for connecting, and it would be wonderful to hear from you, maybe how you're managing to connect with family and friends. Um, at the same time, just to notice, uh, not one important thing about connecting is that we need to be careful about also how much we connect with social media and media in general as we try to follow the news. So managing inform information effectively by focusing on the time and the quality of the news is important. Maybe limiting how much uh, news you watch, maybe only one or twice a day, and seeking reliable sources of information is, uh, can be helpful for our well-being. Um, being mindful, again, we've heard this and I really like it. If you cannot go outside, go inside, which means, uh, you know, connect with yourself, use some relaxation and mindfulness. These are extremely helpful for us to feel calm, more grounded, and better able to separate ourselves from the problem that is outside of us, which again gives us a sense of clarity and inner peace during these uncertain times. And uh, as, uh, as everyone mentioned, for this purpose, we will be doing a relaxation practice at the end of this webinar. Finding meaning and purpose in the events that are happening during the pandemic is also very important, as it can transform our sense of helplessness to one of resilience and choice of action and values that we want to implement during those times to reflect maybe who we are and what matters to us, what we stand for. For example, what we are doing here today, this is an example of this kind of resilience. We are trying to connect and support each other and our community. Um, I, find, I find this very meaningful. Uh, I, I think personally, it kind of gives a sense for me, uh, a sense of uh, perspective also, and uh, again, a sense of meaning and, and connecting with, with what really matters to us. Promoting our wellness. And self-care is, is important more than ever now, really. And I'm, I'm planning to kind of give this a little bit more time towards the end of the presentation, especially as we speak of sleep, because sleep is one of the essential self-care steps. Uh, and we're going to talk in a little bit about that. Now, if we move to the coronavirus-induced sleep problems, so as you've all mentioned, the situation is creating a lot of uh, sleep issues for people. Interestingly, just yesterday, I found on Twitter that a hashtag Coronasomnia. So it seems that people are finding this uh, idea of uh, sleep problems during the pandemic uh, really common, and they are discussing some ideas around that uh, on social media. Uh, many people are struggling with sleep these days for valid reasons. According to the CDC, for example, Stress during an infectious uh, disease out outbreak can include changes in sleep or eating patterns and difficulty sleeping or concentrating. Uh, furthermore, the increase or the heightened anxiety as we are exposed to large volumes of negative information sometimes, and it can keep us up at night, as our brain is constantly wired thinking and worrying about the unknown. So this makes our sleep uh, discussion today really very relevant especially when sleep is both a consequence and a cause for stress. What does that mean? It means that stress can lead to a loss of sleep, and a loss of sleep leads to an increase in stress, which can become a vicious cycle that it's really it's very important to break at some point. So some information about sleep, what we call sleep facts, uh, well, good sleep is crucial for the health of our brain and body. And according to the CDC, uh, about one in three adults do not get the recommended hours of sleep each night. Uh, a study at the World Bank has shown that 35% of staff, for example, report less than six hours of sleep per night. How much sleep do we need? Uh, 
for adults, it's uh, about between seven to nine hours of sleep uh, per night. It, this is the recommended for optimal health. And for uh, children, it's about for six to 12 years of age, it's about nine to 12 hours. For teenagers, teenagers also need, need the sleep, it's very important. Uh, teenagers ages between 13 and 18, they also require about eight to 10 hours of uh, sleep. So what are the stages of sleep? This is also some information for you. Um, I'm gonna uh, go a little bit quickly to uh, talk about the sleep hygiene and how we can address our sleep. But there are two st states of sleep, uh, the rapid eye movement and the non-rapid eye movement, and we cycle through those stages several times each night. So the stage one is the non-REM. It's a transitional phase. It is where we go from being awake, to going to sleep. It actually lasts a few minutes, only a couple of minutes, to several minutes only. And then we go to the stage two, the non-REM sleep, but it's a, period, it's a period of light sleep. This is when the heart rate uh, begins to slow, the core temperature drops. This is right before we enter deep sleep. Stage three, this is the deep sleep stage. It's a period where it's really hard to wake up from, and it's very important to feel refreshed the next morning. We also have the uh, rapid eye movement sleep, which occurs first occurs about 90 minutes after falling asleep. The eyes move rapidly from side to side. That's why it's called REM, uh, behind closed eyelids. And most of our dreaming occurs during the REM sleep, uh, even though also some, some dreams occur in the non-REM sleep. Uh, what about some common sleep disorders? Uh, insomnia is not getting enough sleep. You do trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or waking up too early. Uh, sleep uh, apnea is a condition causing interrupted regular breathing for short periods of time when the upper airway becomes completely or partially blocked. So this can wake you up. Uh, narcolepsy is a brain disorder that causes excessive daytime sleepiness. Restless leg syndrome, this is the urge to move legs and feed during sleep that may affect sleep. Uh, usually, when you have those kinds of disorders, it may be important to consult with a physician to obtain a uh, rapid death diagnosis for these uh, disorders. Now, let's move to our discussion on the benefits of sleep. Why is sleep good for us? Well, sleep actually supports a strong immune system. So, this is important, I mean, especially in the time of the coronavirus and how much our immune system is important these days. Uh, it, uh, sleep helps the body repair, regenerate, and recover. That's why it helps the immune system. Sleep also helps with emotional regulation. We feel better and more able to access and manage our, our emotions when we had a good night's sleep. Uh, very important, sleep consolidates memory uh, and cognition. So the brain is working at night to make connections between events, feelings, and memories. Sleep also ensures uh, greater mental clarity, um, and it lowers the risk of uh, heart disease. If we have a, usually a healthier heart when we sleep. Uh, according to the CDC, uh, again, getting adequate rest each night allows the body's blood pressure to regulate itself. Uh, so a lot of a lot of um, health benefits from the sleep. It also cleanses the brain of harmful protein, and Getting good sleep is associated with a decrease in risky and negative health behaviors in general. So sleep is definitely very important for us. We need sleep. Um, the sleep deprivation, there are you know many different problems when we end up feeling sleep deprived. Because sleep has a key role in learning and it helps us to consolidate our day's events and, and recording critical memories. We are having some, uh, if you can please mute your, um, yourself, that would be great, thank you. So when sleep becomes disrupted, there are alterations in the brain that can cause these processes to become impaired, all those learning processes and those consolidation and uh, of, of, the, of the day's events, but also you know, the immune system. So one thing is mood and behavioral changes, including sometimes the we experience impaired judgment, we feel short-tempered, uh, there is anxiety or depression. Those happen sometimes if we are not sleeping well. 
There is also a decrease in cognitive performance and the ability to learn and maintain information is affected by the lack of sleep. Uh, an increased risk of accidents given the difficulty that we have concentrating during the day. Uh, an impaired immune function as the brain and the body uh, maybe are not able to re reju rejuvenate with sleep. Uh, an increase in pain, we, became, we notice that we may become overly sensitive to pain when we are sleep deprived. And the heart disease, uh, sleep deprivation is associated with an increase uh, increased heart rate, um, blood pressure issues, and higher levels of uh, chemicals that are linked to inflammation. Diabetes. Um, some studies show that getting good enough sleep may help people actually uh, with uh, regulate improving their blood uh, sugar control. Uh, weight gain and obesity. Not getting enough sleep may affect a part of the brain that controls hunger, as the hormones that regulate appetite are disrupted by the lack of sleep. It also happens uh, for people who are not getting enough sleep sometimes. Um, and uh, some studies have actually shown, interestingly, I, had, I didn't know that, this is something that I got to know also recently, that uh, recent studies that sometimes um, people who suffer from lack of sleep experience lower emotional empathy towards others. So it's also something to be mindful of that sleep is helpful really for us and for us in our community. Um, so what do we do? How do we get better sleep during these days? Uh, there are several ideas there. Uh, you know, the basics, sleep hygiene, wellness and self-care, taking care of ourselves, especially if we are doing this during the day. If we have a good day, we're going to have probably a good night as well. So that's why I want to also kind of uh, point to the idea of self-care and wellness during the day, a good lifestyle in a way, and the relaxation techniques, which we're going to be also doing one of them today. So what is sleep hygiene? Sleep hygiene consists of practices and habits that can help you get a good night's sleep. What are some ideas? We have several ideas. Maybe also you could uh, share with us some of the things that you do to help you and maybe help that will be kind of a, we support each other in uh, in this group discussion. Uh, Rua, we have yeah. a very interesting question in the chat box. Uh -huh. uh, and this uh, member asks, what, I'm happy during the day and I'm busy, but it's only at night that these thoughts come. So what is your comment on that one? Absolutely. And this is a very, very relevant, uh, you know, question, because as we are sleeping, this is when sometimes our body is, is not moving anymore. We're not using movement. So what we use is the thoughts and the brain and the worrying. So basically, probably the, the, this uh, person and many of us, that is what is keeping us up at night, the thoughts. It's how we are worrying or thinking about events that have happened maybe during the day that maybe we were not very conscious about uh, addressing during the day, so they come late at night. That is why I want to talk here about one of those skills, which is basically keeping a worry journal at night, and I'm going to be speaking about this in the sleep, one of the sleep hygiene steps is to make sure that you really postpone your worries. So we're going to be talking about this in a bit. It's really working on the thoughts element. Let me keep my thoughts until tomorrow. Tomorrow I allow myself, I give myself permission to postpone thinking. You can write it down next to you. You can have next to your bed um, a, 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 an agenda or a, a, something. You can write in a, a notebook where you can write exactly the thoughts that are keeping you up and then think about them in the morning. Sometimes when you wake up, you're not, you're not going to be finding them, you know, as stressful or you can deal with them differently. So uh, let me continue with the sleep hygiene. Ideas that can help you get a good sleep. Uh, set a consistent sleep schedule. This is extremely important. Why? Because going to bed and uh, and waking, going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time each day, it can help stabilize something called your circadian rhythm. And the circadian rhythm is how our bodies anticipate 
when it's time to sleep and when it's time to wake up. It's actually derived from the Latin, circadium is circa diem, which means approximately a day. Uh, it is basically a 24-hour internal clock that is running in the background of our brain and cycles between sleepiness and alertness. So we can help our circadian rhythm by sleeping and waking up at the same time, each time. Uh, exercise regularly. You don't need to do a lot of exercise, whatever works for you. Sometimes it's only 20 to 30 minutes a day is great. But try not to exercise uh, three hours before bedtime. It's important that you don't really get a lot of energy before you're planning to go to bed. Eat well, again, but not too close to bedtime. If you're hungry at night, eat a light snack. Uh, avoid consuming uh, caffeine, uh, alcohol, and nicotine before bedtime, especially caffeine, eight hours. You should have the last cup maybe of coffee. Should you, It should be like eight hours before you go to bed. So do not consume, stop consuming caffeine eight hours before bedtime. And limit daytime naps. Um, if you really need to take a nap, not more than 20 minutes, 15 to 20 max. Uh, establish a relaxing bedtime routine, maybe a warm bath, reading, relaxation. We can talk more about this now in the discussion as we see what are the issues that people are experiencing. And create a room for sleep. So avoid bright lights, loud sounds. Uh, make sure you're comfortable in your bed. Uh, electronics is not a a good thing to have, especially there is evidence that the blue light from electronics can actually impact your circadian rhythm. It does affect your sleep. And do not go to bed un unless sleepy. But if you go to bed and you're lying in bed awake, you can go to sleep after 20 minutes. Don't stay in bed. It's not a good idea to count the sheep, even though some people find it. It is not the best idea. You need to leave your bed after 20 minutes and go to another room Maybe read, do a relaxing activities, and when you're feeling tired, come back to bed. And as we just mentioned with a very relevant question that was asked, if anxious thoughts are keeping you up, up at night, keep a worry journal next to you and write about those worries and look at them the next day. Maybe you will find looking at them, uh, you, can, you can see that you're able to address issues differently. In the time of the coronavirus, I, will, I, I would like to add something uh, you know, personally, I think it's useful, which is a gratitude journal uh, next to you. So in addition to the worry, worry journal, maybe you can have a gratitude uh, uh, notebook where you write also what you were grateful for before you go to bed. I'm going to shift to the uh, wellness wheel. I really like this, um, this, uh, this tool. Uh, and why are we talking about this in the context of sleep? Because really, uh, it's lifestyle changes during the day do affect, do affect how we sleep at night. So uh, promoting our wellness and self-care will ultimately help you get a better sleep by adopting a healthier and more balanced lifestyle. Let's look at a little bit at this tool for the wellness wheel. It covers the various, the various dimensions of our wellness and it suggests a balanced approach to those various dimensions. So if you look at them, the wellness wheel, it makes us aware of the interconnectedness of each dimension. We have several dimensions, all of them equal. Emotional, how are we doing with our emotions? Uh, environmental, how is, how are, what is the nature of our interaction with the environment? Financial, intellectual, uh, occupational, uh, physical, social, and spiritual. Are we attending to all those aspects in a balanced way? where we, we see that maybe we have some challenges and we need to do more so that we can focus on that and make sure that it's balanced. Uh, it's also important to uh, you know, notice where we are doing well. So what are our strengths? What is really good for us? What are we do, where, do we, uh, where are we succeeding in all those aspects? Also, this can give us a map of what we need to work on to make sure that we are taking care of our uh, wellness. Let me just briefly focus on two aspects that I find, you know, especially relevant or three aspects for this, uh, for our situation now with the pandemic, uh, the emotional aspect. So, you know, people, all of us, we experience a variety of intense emotions. Be it fear or anxiety, uh, frustration or anger, and those are big feelings. 
uh, that can seem sometimes overwhelming for us, uh, what do we do with those feelings? It is important first to recognize that it's normal to have those feelings. We need to allow ourselves to have those feelings without judgment. It's very important for us to you know, work on our self-compassion and be very compassionate and kind with ourselves during those times. So what do you do with those emotions? You can, again, use the idea of journaling and writing them on a, uh, on a piece of paper. Maybe you can share them with your friends or people you trust. You can also talk to a therapist. Sometimes it's useful. And, you know, we, I will kind of talk a little bit about that. But also at the, at the, w, the WBFM provides what we call the Family Consultation Service Program, which provides uh, confidential and, uh, and free counseling for families of staff, anybody above 18 years. So this is for our emotions. What about the physical part? You know, it's really important to take care of our health. Are we getting good enough sleep, nutrition, and exercise? So this is what we are talking about today. Uh, how can we do that? One thing that comes to mind, and I also would like to hear from you, what are your ideas of taking care of your physical health? Uh, is for me, for example, or for many people that uh, um, now we're, we're seeing that people are needing to create a new routine, a new routine that reflects the new normal. So, for example, a plan of the day that includes a time to work, time to take a break, time to eat, time to exercise, and of course, a sleep and wake time to be to make sure that we are managing our sleep well. This is especially important when many many people, most of us, are working from home. Uh, or members of our families are working from home, and we need to balance work demands with home life, including uh, housework, uh, childcare, schoolwork, etc. Um, the social part is very important, and I think we've already talked a bit about this. Again, social distancing does not need to mean social isolation, so we can always find ways uh, to connect. Another way to address sleep issues is by uh, following or doing some uh, relaxation practice. And there are very different uh, and a lot actually of resources about this everywhere on the internet. You can find uh, deep breathing uh, videos or uh, meditation uh, you can listen to, uh, progressive muscle relaxa relaxation. This is more of, um, you know, getting, gives you familiarity with what tension is in your body and how you can relax it. Visualization or guided imagery. And we're going to do one of those. Uh, this is the one that we're going to be doing today. And mindfulness, uh, meditation, um, again, focusing on what's happening, uh, you know, switches your focus to what's happening with your body right now in the present moment. Uh, and yoga. Uh, people do like to use yoga is great also. It's a repetition of poses with deep breathing. There are some sleep apps that um, that can help you also with, with sleep. Uh, you can maybe uh, check check some of them if you are interested. Uh, I do I did notice that some of them are giving the free uh, meditation exercises, Headspace for example. Some of them are free, some of them are not, but even the ones where you have to pay they are giving uh, some free uh, apps these days, some free uh, exercises. So this is, I'm coming towards the end. I think we can maybe now move to the discussion. But first, let me uh, uh, talk a little bit about the Family Consultation Service Program. I love